Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about exploring locations in order to enhance your research. Now, um, I've uh, put a prefix on that of family tree maker, just because in family tree maker it's a lot easier to mine your data uh, to get those lo that location information out. You can still do a lot of this even if you don't have Family Tree Maker if your tree is just online. But of course, software by its nature is a lot more robust than online or um, than online programs. And so, uh, Ancestry, Online Tree, and Family Tree Maker work in sync with each other. So, if you have an online tree, that's great. But if you have Family Tree Maker. There are a lot more things you can do with your data and locations um, or, or working with locations is just one of those things. So that's what we're going to take a look at today. Um, I'm going to talk about some, uh, some genealogy standards as it relates to locations and then just share with you a few ideas of ways in which I use those, uh, that location information to enhance my own research. Let's go ahead and dive in. Let's talk first about some genealogical standards as it relates to locations. Um, the first thing you're going to want to make sure that you do on a consistent basis is that you enter your locations from smallest jurisdiction to largest jurisdiction. Now it depends on where your research takes you, uh, what the labels of those jurisdictions are, but typically in the United States that's going to be um, a city, a county, and then a state. <clears throat> um, in some places there might not be a county. There are some independent cities throughout the U.S. and so it'll just be a city and a state. In some places um, there are um, towns and then there are townships and then there are counties and then there are states. Um, Louisiana doesn't have counties, they have parishes. So it just depends on whatever that location is, um, but always record the, the event in the location place um, consistently from smallest jurisdiction to largest jurisdiction. Now, <clears throat> sometimes we get a little, well, we get really granular and that's excellent, but we need to make sure that we're putting that information in the correct field. So for example, if you happen to know the, the hospital at which someone was born and you want to enter that into a location field, that's fine. There is a place for that. Um, if you happen to know the cemetery where somebody is buried or the street address at which they died or whatever, right? That is a small jurisdiction. That is a very specific place. Um, and there is a place to enter that in Family Tree Maker. So if I come over here and I pull up um, a piece of information here, you're going to see here is um, my great grandfather and this is where he's buried, listed here. And so if I expand that place, you're going to see that there is a spot for place name, and in this case I've got the city, the county, the state, and the country. But then just above that there is a place um, for place detail. And in Family Tree Maker, that's where we're going to put the information about the address, the hospital name, the church, where the wedding occurred, the cemetery where the burial is. Okay, That way it keeps everything in its hierarchy but it allows the mapping programs that we use in our technology, both in Family Tree Maker and online, to recognize the name of that particular location. So you'll see here, um, and I know I get that my Family Tree Maker screen is really small, so you'll want to expand your screen as much as possible. Um, but you'll see here, I have the full name showing up here in the burial field place, but again, when I expand that, that Memorial Gardens name is up here in the place detail. It's not actually part of the place name that is going to be used by the mapping software. So record your locations from smallest jurisdiction to largest jurisdiction, but make sure that those really, really small things like hospitals, cemeteries, churches, addresses, that those go into the place detail field, not into um, the city town county state slots, okay? Number two here in genealogical standards is to include all jurisdictions. Here's what I mean by that. If you don't know the name of a county where a particular city or town is located, look it up. I cannot tell you how often I see the name of a city 
uh, and the county is just skipped right over. And here's the thing, if you've been doing genealogy for uh, any length of time, you know that many, many, many genealogical records that we use are created at the county level, which means that it's imperative that we know what county is associated with that location. As a matter of fact, I would wager that knowing the county is even more important genealogically than knowing the name of the town or the specific GPS location where an event occurred. Um, now, that does mean you have to look it up. And very, very often it's just as simple as Googling, right? You can go into Google, you can type in the name of a town, the name of the state, and the word county, and it will bring up the answer. What county is, you know, Little Rock, Arkansas in? And, and Google will provide the answer to that. Keep in mind that county boundaries do change over time. And so you need to um, figure out a consistent way to record your locations. Um, there are, um, th and that's the next piece of advice, which is be consistent in how you enter your locations. There are two schools of, thoughts, of thought in genealogy, um, and both have some validity. I will uh, tell you my opinion, but my opinion is, is just that. Um, so here are the two schools of thought. One is that in the location field, you record the location as it was at the time the event occurred. So when the person was born there, when the person died there, what was that place called? Okay, and that's fine. Um, that is certainly one way to do it. Um, and then in some kind of notes or descriptive field, you can put further information about what that place is called today. Okay, and, and I do mean to put that into descriptive field. So in Family Tree Maker and in your online tree, you'll notice you have a location field where the location information goes. And then directly underneath that, you have a description field where you can enter additional descriptive information. I would strongly encourage you to use that description field, okay, instead of putting additional information, again, in that place field. I've seen people write, you know, Crawford, now Simpson County, right? And that, uh, that breaks all mapping programs, um, and it does not allow you to consistently review your data in any kind of a meaningful way. So here the two schools of thought are you put the um, location as it was at the time the event occurred and then in the description field you put the current location or, and this is my preference, you put the location as it is today and then in the description field put the location as it was at the time the event occurred. I'll tell you why I've chosen that convention, um, and it has to do strictly with the technology. It has to do with, with mapping. Um, I want to be able to um, map quickly, have my software or my online program map my locations for me. And if it is a location that is no longer in existence, the map can't find it, okay? Not only that, again, a technology issue, I want to be able to filter you know, to everybody who ever had an event in their life at a specific location, particularly if I'm going to go to that location to do research or to visit cemeteries, or if I'm going to try to group together a group of people in my database based on that location. Um, I want it to be based on a physical location on a map that is quickly recognized by the technology. So I put the name of the place as it exists today. Where is that spot on a map and what is it called? And then in the description field, I will put the name of the place historically. Now it's important, regardless of which way you do it, that you record both, okay? Because you need to know where it is, but you also need to know where the records might be. And very often the records are gonna be held by the historic county or you know, in some cases even state boundaries have changed. So for example, my family lived in that little um, panhandle of West Virginia that at one time was part of the state of Virginia. And so there are records about my family in the Virginia State Archives, even though it is now uh, West Virginia, the spot of land where they lived. So I need to know both of those pieces of information. And I have just chosen to put the current location in the location field 
and the historic location in the description field. Regardless of which way you choose to do that, be consistent, okay? Be consistent in how you enter those locations. Another warning about consistency or another just word of advice about consistency is if you choose to put um, USA or United States or whatever country append, um, uh, appended to the end of your location, again, be consistent. If you choose to enter USA, always enter USA. If you choose not to enter USA, never enter USA, okay? Um, the, the point, again, is the more consistent your data is, the easier it's going to be for you to work with it later. Uh, when you end up with inconsistencies, it gets really messy. Kind of a, a little sidebar to that, one of the identifying pieces of information about an individual is their location. And so when we're working with things like DNA results and we're trying to connect with a match, um, surnames are actually less valuable to a lot of people than locations. If I know that my family lived in you know, Rockingham County, Virginia in the 1780s and so did yours and we're a DNA match, that's far more valuable information to me than knowing that you have Joneses or Campbells or Simpsons in your tree. And so that being consistent in how you enter those locations also allows you to work uh, more collaboratively with DNA matches, with other cousins that you find to make sure that you've got the right people in the right place at the right time. So that is just a, a review of genealogical standards and how important it is that you, um, that you enter all of the jurisdiction, you do it from smallest to largest, and you're consistent in how you enter your locations um, over time. Now that may mean some of you need to do a little bit of cleanup on your database, and that's just fine. Family Tree Maker actually provides for that. They do have a places tab here. I've actually done an entire video about the places tab. You can find that in the Family Tree Maker um, playlist on YouTube. And basically what I walk you through is how to go through, and I have some cleanup to do too, how you go through the, you know, um, locations in your database that sometimes just um, need to be cleaned up or because you copied a record and that record pulled a location over or because you didn't get complete information. Um, I can see one right here on my screen where I've got, it looks like Stark Family Cemetery and that's all I have listed and so now I need to go do some research and figure out where in the world is the Stark Family Cemetery and get that particular location for Mr. William Driscoll Ingalls cleaned up right away. Um, so an entire video out there on how to clean up your places so that they're more consistent. I encourage you to go watch that video at some point as well. So now let's spend the rest of our time talking about um, how locations then can help enhance your research. The first thing you're going to want to do is learn more about locations. So if you start to see a pattern um, as you enter locations or do research, you're going to start to see that, you know, your family settled in or lived in for long periods of time certain places. So for me, one of those locations is Hawkins County, Tennessee. Um, in and around the town of Rogersville, uh, I have family that still lives there today, distant family. Um, I actually went and met some of them a couple years ago on a vacation because uh, that's what genealogists do on vacation, apparently, is troll cemeteries and um, town archives and, and knock on the doors of random distant relatives. And, um, and so I wanted to learn everything I could about Hawkins County, Tennessee, because uh, I was seeing a lot of family activity there. It was coming up um, over and over as a specific location. And so here are just some of my favorite resources for learning more about a particular location. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the state, right? So if I click on the search tab on Ancestry, that's going to take me to <clears throat> this, the general search page. If you scroll down past the search box, at the bottom of that page, there's a map. And on that map, you can click on any state or you can switch over to um, other areas of the world and click on any country. Um, you, I'm, you can click on any state on the map. So I'm going to go ahead and click on Tennessee, and that's just going to give me some basic information about what kinds of records Ancestry has online about Tennessee. I can click on this history tab and learn a little bit more about the, the history of the state. 
I can click on this resources tab and there I'm going to find links to um, some of the other locations in Tennessee where genealogical records are held. State libraries and archives, state genealogical societies and historical societies. Um, in Tennessee in particular, they have the Tennessee uh, virtual archive that the state has been putting together. Um, the Atlanta Regional um, Office of the National Archives of the United States holds records for Tennessee. It just gives me some really great resources there. So that's probably, that's almost always my first stop is just that place page. My next stop is going to be in the Learning Center on Ancestry. In the Learning Center, um, there are two things in particular that I'm going to want to pay attention to. The first one is under Research Guides. Under Research Guides, um, Ancestry has created a series of state research guides. Uh, I think we just finished up our last state just a few weeks ago. And if you scroll down to the particular state that you're interested in, it will open up a PDF file. Now these PDF files are typically between oh, four and eight pages long. And you can print them out and use them as a resource to your, um, to your, to your, a resource to your research. That, I was having a hard time getting that out. Um, and if you don't want to print it out or if you keep an electronic copy, one of the things you'll notice besides historical backgrounds, uh, fantastic timelines, is that again, there are links embedded in this PDF file that will take you directly to specific databases online at Ancestry or to state resources um, off, um, off of Ancestry's website, but like, the st again, State Historical Society, um, different counties where there's different research and resources available. Um, really some, some great time and effort has been put into creating these state research guides to give you information. Um, Kentucky or Tennessee in particular here, you'll notice, um, has information pulled out of the wiki and the red book, which is my next stop on the Learning Center. In the Learning Center, if you go into the Ancestry wiki, you can consume all of that information in its original form, or you can use this abbreviated version in the State Research Guide. But basically what the information contained in the Family History wiki about any particular state, um, and you're going to find it mostly in the Red Book, is going to be information about when each county was formed in the state. So now we're getting down to, I've looked at the state resources, now what's available for my specific county. So I can scroll down here to Hawkins County, which is the county that I'm interested in. It was uh, formed in 1785. It looks like, check these, the parent county for Hawkins County was Spencer County. Spencer County was renamed Sullivan County. And then I have information here about when birth, marriage, death, probate, when any kind of record started being kept by that particular county. One of the things you're gonna notice is that birth and death records were not kept fairly early by most places. Uh, marriage records were, marriage records um, have always uh, been involved, the government's always been involved in marriage records, but birth and death not so much, usually not until the late 1800s, early 1900s. Land records, really early. Probate records are available and court records are available only if the courthouse never burned down. And so you start to get kind of this idea of what's available for your particular county. Not only that, the other thing that you can start to look for is where um, your county was broken off into other counties. So not only do I want to look at, at Hawkins County, but are there other counties that were created out of Hawkins County? In this case, Claiborne County was created um, from parts of Hawkins County in 1801. And so depending on where exactly in the county my family lived, I need to maybe pay attention to records now in Claiborne County. So those are the resources that I go to almost immediately every time. The state pages under search, and then the state research guide and the ancestry wiki uh, under the learning center. 
a couple of other resources I use. One is mapofus.org. What this is, is it's a map that shows the changing boundaries over time for any particular location, which again is very important to know and understand. It's important to know that before 1777, um, that Tennessee was actually just part of North Carolina. And then you can, you know, go year by year and see what counties were created. Uh, at one point, um, you know, you see large chunks of it broken up. You start to see the counties form. Uh, for example, um, most of Tennessee at one point was actually going to be, well, it was actually called the state of Franklin uh, before it was named uh, Tennessee. You start to see the formation. There's Hawkins County, which is the county that I'm interested in. Uh, you can start to see how it's formed and then how it gets broken up into other counties over time. And you compare that to the time that your family lived there. And that gives you a start to give, starts to give you a really clear picture again of where the records, where you should be looking for records about your family, not always just in the state, but maybe in another state or in other counties. The last um, online resource that I jump to uh, almost immediately when I'm researching a new location is USGenWeb. USGenWeb.org, a lot of their pages are hosted on RootsWeb, which is owned by Ancestry. Everything on here is free, um, and it's all created by volunteers. So every state page is different, every county page is different, because they're all individually run by different volunteers. But it'll give you a good idea of some of the resources available. So you just click on states and come down here, click on Tennessee. That's going to take me to the Tennessee GenWeb page. Or I can come directly to the county map and I can click on Tennessee's broken up into east, middle, and west there. And then I can click on Hawkins County and that will take me to the Hawkins County US GenWeb page that has additional information about that particular county, what records are available, um, just some really rich resources on some of these uh, US Gen Web pages. So uh, learning more about those locations when you start to see them come up over and over and over in your tree is going to be vital to successful genealogy research. The more you know about a place, um, and the more you know about that place over the time period that your family lived there, the more likely you are going to, to know where to go to find the records that you need to keep building your family tree and, and telling your family story. Another thing you're going to want to do is look for patterns uh, in your family tree. Now, when, when we talk about patterns, we're talking about things like migration patterns. You know, does, do, do you have this family in Hawkins County, Tennessee that lived there for decades and decades and decades, and then all of a sudden the entire family in 1832 picked up and moved to Carroll County, Arkansas? Or did somebody move to Carroll County, Arkansas, and then a few years later a few more people moved there, and then a few years later a few more people moved there, right? Those are the kinds of patterns that you need to be looking for. And so again, sometimes it's easier just to pull up a list and say, okay, you know, what's happening here? Where are these people um, starting at? Where are they ending up at? Uh, look at where the children are born. Uh, see if you can see patterns there. So here, for example, um, in the Dan Jones and Margaret Francis Jones family, yes, they were um, cousins that married one another. They were both born in Rogersville in Hawkins County, Tennessee. They both died in Washington County, Arkansas. But if you look at the birthplaces of their children, you get a little bit clearer picture. So their child born in about 1850 was born in Hawkins County, Tennessee. Their child born in May of 1852 was born in Washington County, Arkansas. So for this particular family unit, I can pretty closely nail down that they immigrated or migrated rather from Hawkins County, Tennessee to Washington County, Arkansas sometime between 1850 and spring of 1852. If I um, did a little bit more research and could nail down the specific birth date of William Jones, I might be able to narrow that window a little bit more. So I start to see some of those patterns. Then I can look at the other family members and see if that information also holds true for them. So if we look at Margaret's parents, again, born in Hawkins County, Tennessee, died in Washington County, Arkansas, um, but all of their children 
were born in Hawkins County, Tennessee, because they're all older. So I can start looking at some of these siblings or aunts and uncles of, of my family members and look again for patterns. Did, did everybody in the whole family go in that same time period? Were there other children born, some in Washington County, some in Hawkins County? Can I narrow that window down to see if the whole family migrated together? If you've got an entire family, and I'm talking like several generations of a family, you know, 30, 40 people migrating from one place to another at the same time, it's very possible that there's going to be something published somewhere about that group of people, which is going to be a little bit different than what we call chain migration when, you know, one or two nuclear families move and then, you know, parents come and then siblings come with their children and that, that migration spread out over time. But if you've got a group of 40, 50, 60 people migrating together, um, it's very likely that there's going to be some notation of that somewhere, maybe in Hawkins County because they left. Uh, why did they leave? Maybe in Washington County because all of a sudden they arrive and start buying up all the land. You know, is there a town or a creek or something that's that's being named after them because they all just showed up all of a sudden? You know, now all of a sudden this is Jones Creek and, you know, that's that's the name because this whole Jones family moved in. So looking for patterns like that, and, and I find it easier to do in Family Tree Maker because I don't have to wait for web pages to load. I can just quickly um, bounce around my tree and see exactly what's happening in several of these families very quickly. Okay, um, And so I can look for some of those patterns. So migration patterns tell a story. They tell a story about what's happening in with that family and, and give you, again, more clues about where you could possibly go to get more information. And um, then you can chase down records because now you know you have a little bit better idea of what kinds of things you might be looking for. Let me just share with you one final kind of bonus tip about the way I use locations specifically in Family Tree Maker. You may be aware that Ancestry adds a, an average of about a million new records every day to our website. And one of the easiest ways to keep up with that is this What's Happening widget here on your home page. Um, or you can go directly to the card catalog. So I can come in here to the card catalog. This um, list always, by default, it sorts by popularity. But I can change that sort over here to Date Added. And what that does is it takes the new stuff and it puts it at the top of the list. And you can see, you can hover over it and it'll tell you when Ancestry added that record um, for that particular location. So I'm going to come here and I'm going to just filter down to um, anything for the U.S. And then that's going to take all of those U.S. records, the new U.S. records, and put them at the top of the list. And you can see here now we've got some records from Hartford, Connecticut, and some New York National Guard records from World War I, and some Philadelphia Charity to Immigrants records from um, through the 1800s, Colorado passenger lists, Indiana passenger lists, Alabama passenger lists, patients at naval hospitals, um, Washington County records. This is interesting to me. Right? And that's kind of how I do that. That's like, you just listened to uh, my internal process out loud. I just go through these until something catches my attention. And when something catches my attention, I will always go and read um, about the records so that I can make sure I understand what they are. If it's browse, in this case there's no search box, it's just images that we've put online, I can take a look and see you know, well, what are these particular records? In this case, I think there's some school records and some marriage records. There's some really cool things happening here. Now, these records start in 1856 and go through 2009, so they're pretty comprehensive. So here's uh, an example of what I might do in order to use these particular records. So I've pulled up this list here. So Spokane County, and it looks like we've got birth records that start in 1890 here in this particular database. So I'm going to come over here to Family Tree Maker and I'm going to open up my little index panel over here and in my index panel I have a filter. So I'm going to go ahead and click filter and I'm going to filter in anybody who has ever uh, lived in, born, died, married, has any connection with Spokane County, Washington. So I can do that here in my database. Again, it's a, it's a feature that's not available um, you know, anywhere else. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to put Spokane in 
any fact place. And I'm going to click OK and let's just see how many people in my database have ever been associated with or um, lived anywhere near Spokane. And it looks like there's 33 people. And so I can go ahead and click OK. And now I'm looking at a filtered list of these 33 people who, are, who in my database who have lived in um, Spokane, Washington. And then I can start to compare that to the kinds of records that are available here for Spokane, Washington. Now, somebody might ask, well, why don't you just do a search? Or why don't you just, you know, wait for the shaky leaf? Well, let me remind you, the shaky leaf hints only hint the top 10% of our most popular databases. We do not provide shaky leaf hints for every single one of the 15 billion records in our database. Second, not all of the records in our collections are indexed. This is a perfect example. Okay, so this will never come up in a search until it's been indexed. And if I want to use these records before they've been indexed, this is just a way I can do that. So I can, I can come in here and I can manipulate this data to pull up any kind of a list. Let me exclude everybody, filter somebody in. I can say I want to see people who have, you know, who have ever lived in a particular state you know, or a particular town. And then I want to, you know, filter out anybody who was born in the 1900s and filter out anybody who was born in the 1700s. So I'm left with a list of people who lived in the state of Virginia sometime in the 1800s. So again, the way I can manipulate my data then allows me to go look at records for that time and that place specifically so that I can be a little bit more successful in my research. It's a great way to chase down records online. It's an excellent way to chase down records offline. Every time I go on a research trip, I go into Family Tree Maker, create a list of people who ever lived there so that I know who I'm looking for in the cemeteries, what surnames I'm looking for in the state archives, wherever, wherever I happen to be. Um, I want to create a list of people that were associated with that place so that I can be more successful in my research. Hope this was useful for you if you're watching this live at our regularly scheduled time. I will be on chat in just a few minutes to answer any additional questions you may have. Or feel free to leave a comment here on YouTube if that's where you're watching this video archived at a later date. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.